Good afternoon. Welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. This is a series presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in partnership with UC Irvine Health. My name is Adrian Windsor and I'm a board member of the foundation. We would like to thank our generous sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith. They have been with us since the beginning of this program. They were its initiators and they have generously supported us every year. And we are very, very grateful. This program will conclude with a Q&A session. So we request that you hold all questions until the end of the lecture. Please use the Q&A box to ask any questions instead of the chat box. So I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Katie Rankell. Katie is the program director at UCI Health Weight Management. She is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. Katie graduated from San Diego State University, California State University. She obtained her registered dietitian license March 2004, and she has worked as an outpatient dietitian ever since. She worked at Mission Hospital from 2002 to 11, where she performed medical nutrition therapy for individuals of all ages. In November of 2011, she received a certification as a diabetes educator. She's going to talk to us this afternoon about something that I think we're all very interested in. It's achieving the ideal weight and staying there. So welcome, Katie. We are so pleased to have you with us. Thank you, Adrian. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Reaching and maintaining your healthiest weight. Okay, so since it's January, I thought I would start with kind of tying in with New Year's resolutions. And I looked up what were the most popular for 2021. We're in an interesting time right now. And numerous articles reported these five as the most popular. Number one being exercise more. Number two being eat healthier. Number three, lose weight. Number four, save money. And number five, self-care. So when I saw this, these definitely tie into what I'm going to talk to speak on today. Uh, so we will keep these in mind as we kind of go through uh, my lecture. So with the current COVID-19 pandemic, um, there's been numerous studies that have tied the obesity and the increasing severity of the symptoms. So with obesity, you're 113% more likely to land in the hospital, 74% more likely to be admitted to the ICU, and 48% more likely to end in death. I've seen more recent studies that that more mortality rate has been up over 50%. So I feel like now more than ever, you know, weight is a big issue and managing our weight is extremely important. So with that ties into, we have a whole new set of struggles on our hands. So with it's what we're 10 months now from kind of the first shutdown. And with that, there's, you know, numerous reports of increased stress, anxiety, depression, loneliness, boredom. You know, now we're at home, there's excessive snacking, larger portions, we're working close to the kitchen mindless eating, erratic eating times. And this affects not only the adults working or staying at home, but also the kids that might now be at home or doing distant learning. Here's kind of my at-home distractions. I'm sure we all have them. I have two girls. Um, I, born, I was born and raised in Orange County. I have a little tiny three pound dog that distracts us. So, you know, we're all up against a lot, right? And I mean, I hear the wind outside, so I'm glad we're virtual today and didn't have to travel anywhere and hope everyone's safe. But we wanna look at kind of how do we manage our weight, not just in general, but also right now when we have all this going on and we're juggling more than ever.
Okay, so I have the privilege of running the UCI Health Weight Management Program. We have won Best Fast Weight Loss Diet for the past six years in a row with US World News, um, an excellent medically monitored weight loss program. What I wanna to talk to you today about is, you know, our patients, what do they do to keep the weight off, okay? So our kind of phase two of our program is our lifestyle program where people transition to more of a Mediterranean diet, they're still held accountable and over 85% of our patients in this phase two are keeping the weight off. So that is significant. When we look at compared to surgical options, other diets, most common we see weight gain afterwards. So what are patients doing that we see they're truly keeping the weight off? Okay, and with that comes, you know, getting off medications. So reducing cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes medications. So the big question is how, how do we do it? Okay, so when I was in school, we learned the food guide pyramid. The food guide pyramid has since been replaced with what used to be called a diabetic plate is now just the healthy American plate. And that's looking at half our plate should be fruits and vegetables, a quarter of our plate or the palm of your hand should be protein, one cup or your fist roughly of a whole grain, and then milk or dairy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is what we typically see though. This is our kind of sad American diet where fruits and vegetables and fresh produce make up a very small portion. And there's a larger portion of high fat meats, high sugar, high fat grains, sweets, processed foods. So that's where we really need to make that shift. So let's kind of go through, you know, the different sections of that plate. So if we look at carbohydrates first, that includes not just the grain group, but all fruits and vegetables, all beans and lentils, the dairy group counts as a carbohydrate, as well as any snacks, sweets, desserts, beverages are going to count towards a carbohydrate. And what do we hear in the media or online is very hard. Often we hear carbohydrates are bad. You need to eliminate carbohydrates to reach and maintain a healthy weight. Um, so let's look at kind of some of those myths. The role of carbohydrates, we do want around half of our caloric intake to come from carbohydrates. So 45 to 55%, we could say roughly at least 50% we need carbohydrates for fuel. That's the first fuel we used. If we're gonna exercise, even just getting through our day, we burn calories at rest, we need carbohydrates. Okay, so carbohydrates aren't bad, but there are kind of, I will acknowledge the fact that there might be some bad carbs versus good carbs. So those the bad carbs, I, I don't like that word, but the carbs we wanna limit are the refined, higher in sugar, simple, sugary cereal, um, baked goods, chips, snacky items. That would be kind of the, the simple carbohydrates we wanna lim limit. Complex carbohydrates is more the whole grain, they're high in fiber, they increase satiety, the feeling of fullness at a meal. They help keep blood sugar stable. Um, examples would be a whole grain bread, oatmeal, lentils, things like that. Okay, how much fiber do we need? It does vary a little, men and women, as well as age. So there's to kind of give you an, a you know more specific. Generally, even if you go by somewhere in the window of 25 to 35 grams, you're doing good. Um, they say that average American gets in 10 to 12 grams. So that's half of where we need to be. Um, so when you're looking at your, your whole grains and your carbohydrates, looking at how much fiber you're taking is a good place to start. So here's an example. We could grab that muffin for 600 to 900 calories, or we could grab the whole plate of fruit for 600 calories. 
And then which is going to sustain you longer, which is going to cause you to be hungrier faster. You know, the plate of the fruits and veggies, we could spread that out throughout our entire day. That muffin, I'm going to eat that with my coffee in the morning and be hungry 30 minutes later. Um, so it's really kind of looking at what are we choosing. So fruits and veggies, again, eating healthy or maintaining a healthy weight doesn't always equal eating less. For some people, it equals eating more. Um, just like that last slide, and as well as this visual of kind of the grilled, you know, eat the rainbow, the variety of fruits and veggies, trying to get that five servings a day, going to fruits and vegetables, not only to fill half your plate, that plate image we saw, but also for our snacks, you know, grabbing a fruit and vegetable for a snack in combination with a healthy protein is a good go-to versus opening that pantry and adding more of kind of the, the chips, cookies, the snacks we find in the pantry. Okay, so protein. Now we're looking at that quarter of your plate. You know, protein's gonna make up 20 to 25% your daily caloric intake. We need protein to build and repair muscles, um, hair, skin, blood. Um, it also increases that satiety. Um, protein is important to know how much you should be eating. Um, so a lot of the diets on the market say carbs are bad, no carbs, eat all the protein you want. There is some downsides to too much protein. So too much protein can be hard on your kidneys. Um, it can lead to heart, dig heart disease, digestive issues based on the higher fat content that comes along with eat all the protein you want. Um, it can also lead to weight gain. Excess protein is excess calories as well. So it does help to know how much protein you should be getting in. Um, if you exercise a lot or trying to build muscle, you need more protein. When we look at fats, that kind of ties in with that protein. What proteins are we choosing? Are we choosing protein that's animal fats, high in saturated fats? Are we choosing healthier protein that is more monounsaturated or omega fats? So fats should make up also kind of a quarter, 25% of your daily caloric intake. It helps to regulate temperature, insulate our organs, um, it's also used for fuel in more long distance endurance sports, whereas the carbohydrates kind of that first initial fuel we use. Um, with fats, we want to choose kind of more of the monounsaturated and omega-3 fats, and that would be choosing fish, nuts, um, olive oil, natural peanut butter, things like that. So here's kind of a visual in a different way. If we could look internally at our stomach and our stomach is you know, a set size and this is what 500 calories looks like of different foods and that feeling of fullness and satiety. So when we're choosing something that's you know, highly fat concentrated like an oil or a cheese, it barely fills our stomach, that 500 calories. And then you can see with meat a little bit more, and then the grains, and then the veggies, you know, 500 calories of veggies can really fill us up. Okay, so back to kind of what can we do? So now we, we start looking at the caloric density of foods. So here's a dinner where it's a 12 ounce steak and a cup of black coffee or black tea at 1200 calories. Here's a dinner plate just under that at 1150 calories. But now we have 12 ounces of fish, we have a salad, we have a side of broccoli, corn, two small baked potatoes with a tablespoon of sour cream on each, a small roll with a pat of butter, even a scoop of ice cream. We can add a little cream and sugar to our coffee. So eating healthier doesn't have to be eating less or feeling deprived but it definitely looks like eating differently and making kind of those healthier, lower calorie choices. Here's some simple swaps for kind of improving 
the, the nutritional value, taking a sandwich and instead of mayonnaise, using hummus, instead of butter on your toast, putting a little olive oil or a, a natural nut butter, instead of a heavy portion of meat in a pasta, doing half the meat with vegetables, instead of a chocolate cake or a baked de de dessert, having a baked fruit with cinnamon, a little Greek yogurt, or a light Cool Whip, instead of a bagel with jam, which is all simple carbohydrates, doing an oatmeal with berries. So now you've added a lot of fiber, fruit, antioxidants. So trying to make kind of those, what are the foods you like and how can you make simple swaps to make them healthier or lower calorie? It's not quite barbecue time yet. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure if you guys can see this. I have something popping up on my screen. Okay, sorry about that. So not quite summer barbecue time, but here's an example of, you know, just having bites at a barbecue because you don't feel like you can really eat much. You know, a little bite of a sausage, a bite of a hot dog, and a small scoop of a potato salad or macaroni salad adding up to over 500 calories or having, you know, healthy grilled barbecue where you can have two large slices of watermelon, a whole corn on the cob, portobello mushrooms, potatoes, asparagus, zucchini spears, and grilled shrimp. You know, which one is going to be more satisfying, more filling, you know, so it doesn't have to be going, you know, feeling deprived and like you can't eat anything or you can't enjoy things. Hopefully, hopefully by summer we'll be able to gather and do things like, uh, you know, picnic or barbecue. So here's a single raspberry tart at 440 calories, or can we make a, you know, substitution and get by with you know, a cup of raspberries with a light Cool Whip topping up, you know? So here, I mean, which one's gonna be, we wouldn't have to have eight cups, but that's the difference of making that caloric switch of how we can still enjoy food, just do it differently. Okay, which is gonna last you longer, that burger or the full turkey sandwich with vegetable soup, with a few crackers, with an apple and celery. Another trick is just changing your plate size. So when we look at this visual, all four plates have the same amount of food on it. So all four plates have three ounces of tuna, a cup of carrots and a half a cup of cooked rice. Okay, if you're served that largest 12 inch plate, you kind of feel deprived. It doesn't look very, the plate doesn't look filling, so you don't feel full. We're, we're visual eaters. Whereas if I was served that eight and a half inch plate, I mean, it looks pretty satisfying. So I'm gonna feel more satisfied. So sometimes just using smaller dishes, smaller plates can mentally kind of alter the game and make you feel like you're, you're satisfied. But unfortunately, here's kind of the truth of the environment and the culture we live in. We're living in an environment that's, let's go bigger, let's go crazier. You know, here's a Cheeto chicken sandwich, or, you know, back when we were going to the Orange County Fairgrounds, you could get not just a Snickers bar, but now a Snickers bar deep fried. Or instead of a burger, now you can get a burger that's on two Krispy Kreme donuts instead of a bun. So we've turned into this, you know, bigger is better culture and society. And so it's very easy. What we are seeing is the rate of obesity increasing. It, you know, it's not plateauing. Every year it's going up. So we have to do something different. We have to be proactive if we're not going to see our weight creep up. Okay, so with that type of eating, that image we just saw, not only on the exterior do we see weight gain, 
but inside what's going on inside our body, we start to just see extreme inflammation. And that can be, you know, seen as pain, swelling, limited mobility. It can be external and a rash or loss of function. But we know studies show certain foods trigger inflammation inside our bodies. So foods that are known to cause inflammation or are refined carbohydrates. So that simple, you know, white, white bread, pastries, French fries, highly processed foods. So when we think highly processed foods, it's that, you know, triple trouble. It either is super high in sugar, salt, or fat. One of the three. Sodas, red meat, alcohol. And with alcohol, I'm not talking, you know, four ounces of wine with your dinner or the occasional alcohol, excessive alcohol um, definitely causes inflammation. So these are things we want to limit for not only our external weight, but what's internally going on in our bodies. We know inflammation leads to cancer as well. These are things we want to limit. This ties in with, I added you know, these slides. Every five years, the USDA puts out a new dietary guidelines. So the dietary guidelines happen to be updated just this January. So if we look at the differences, the new focus is on plant-based foods. So more and more studies are suggesting at least half your protein intake should come from a plant-based source. So that doesn't, you know, only mean, you know, veggie sources or soy protein. It could be beans, it could be lentils, it could be tofu, it could be, there's a lot of whole grains that have a lot of protein, um, as well as look at number, the second one on there, avoid low carb diets. So a lot of studies show the benefit of fiber and whole grains in reducing cancers, heart health, longevity. Um, so there's definitely an avoidance of going to diets that are extreme low carbohydrate. There's also a warning against red and processed meats and a shift to drink water instead of that milk. Mainly with that milk, we see the added fats and added sugar and the benefit of milk we can get from our food the calcium and vitamin D. Um, so that's something you can look up if you're interested. There's lots of research studies that support what they choose to include in the dietary guidelines. So here's kind of, you know, with where we're at today in general, what can we do? And then especially now, almost a year into kind of a pandemic, you know, socially distance year, Let's look at kind of what are, narrow it down to 10 healthy strategies. So number one is create a routine. More than ever, we need a routine. Life was kind of, for some people, ripped out from under them. Structure went out the window. Day-to-day -day looks totally different. Let's add a routine and structure back in place. And a structure with your eating is so helpful. So I know to the the you know, the timeline here might not work for everyone. This is an example. The, the big point here is ideally, if you can eat every two and a half to three hours, you're gonna keep your metabolism going. So that's how many calories you burn throughout the day. So we all wanna be a well-oiled machine that's burning more calories than not. So if you can space it every two to three hours, that's great. You know, if not, if you know, I'm not gonna get a morning snack, then have a you know, more hearty breakfast to carry you through to that lunch. You know, setting an alarm. I know I easily work through my snacks, my lunch, but if I set an alarm, it does help me stop and remember to eat before I get overly hungry to where then I'm gonna overeat. Number two, exercise. We know we need to move. Um, are we making excuses? Do we need to eliminate those excuses? Remind ourselves that anything counts. We just need to move. So even though, you know, the gym is closed or it's crazy windy outside or it's actually raining in Orange County, you know, we can shift. What else can we do? You know, do we have 
jugs of water or cans? Can we do exercises while watching the television? Can we, you know, walk inside? Can we walk outside? What is it we can do? Ideally, they say, you know, it's best to not do it right before bed. Some people don't have a problem with that. Um, the big thing is just to make sure your body temperature kind of cools back down, your heart rate cools back down, and you'll sleep better. Get exposure to sunlight. I know personally, this is a huge one for me. You know, sometimes we just need to get outside, a change of scenery, fresh air, the vitamin D. It does do wonders for just our mood, reducing stress, resetting our brain clock, helping with our sleep cycle of day and night. You know, anytime, even if it's a, a work meeting or a phone call, can you step outside and do it? Can you take your 10 minute break outside just to kind of get that, that sunlight and change of scenery? Quench your thirst. Okay, are we getting in our fluids? So ideally 64 ounces a day, okay? How are we tracking that? You know, do we have four kind of regular size 16 ounce bottles? Do we have two 32 ounce bottles we get through during the day? Our body doesn't always know the difference between thirst and hunger. So if we're not satisfying our thirst or we're not staying hydrated, then we're more likely to overeat and try and get it through food, which is not a productive route. Um, there's apps, Waterlog's one of the apps. You can set a timer. I know one of my daughters bought a full 64 ounce jug that kind of has timeline through the day to make sure she gets it all in. Whatever works for you. Um, another one kind of, Every slide probably touches on sleep a little bit, but if you're sensitive to caffeine, the recommendation is to avoid caffeine after kind of two, three o'clock in the afternoon, if you're on a typical daytime schedule to sleep better at night. Environment. When you look around, you know, if that's working from home, if you're in the office and at home, look around you. Is your environment set up for success? Does your environment look healthy? You know, what's out, what's visually available? Is it a bowl of fruit on the counter? Is it, you know, something else on the counter? What's close by? So looking at your environment is huge. If you're staying home, making sure everything in the house is healthy. If you're at work, what's in your desk drawer for if you get hungry or what's available in the break room? Are you, you know, spending too much time close to the kitchen? Is your workstation right next to the kitchen? Do you need to move and set up in a different room? Um, again, it kind of gets back to that schedule too of having set eating times helps and applies here as well. But, you know, is your environment, does your environment look healthy? Does it look like it's setting you up for success? Planning for success. Pre-planning your meals and snacks is going to help. You will do better, especially if you do it when you're not hungry. Same with going to the grocery store. Have a list. Stick with the list. Don't go hungry. Don't impulse buy. Measuring your portions. You know, here's an example, even with the, to get in the fruits and veggies during the day. Here's pre-planned, pre-portioned. We can do it at home with our Tupperware or mason jars, or if we don't have the time, we might pay a little bit extra and get it pre-portioned, ready to go at the grocery store. You know, do we just need to grab a fruit tray or a veggie tray to where it's cut, ready to go? And that can be what we grab and, you know, grab for a snack if we're busy during the day and don't have time to cut it up midday. Okay, we should shop like the choose my plate as well. So if half your plate is gonna be fruits and vegetables, then when we're shopping, half our cart should be fruits and vegetables, okay? This is, must be a pre-COVID shopping experience. I don't see Lysol and hand sanitizer, but you know, making sure our cart, are we buying what we should be eating? Now this gets a little harder. You know, feelings and emotions do affect the scale, okay? If you know, it's, it definitely helps to keep 
a food law. You know, if you track your food intake, you're going to do better. Same with your feelings and emotions. If you can track, you know, wrote, jot down, why do you find yourself wanting to eat? Is it a scheduled time? If so, then you should eat. If not, are you stressed, tired, anxious, bored? You know, but also acknowledge those feelings. If you're stressed, if you're upset, you know, journal about it, write about it, you know, and, and ask yourself, is eating going to help that? Is eating going to make you feel less stressed? Is eating going to bring you, make you feel less sad about what's going on in your life? Or can you start changing that behavior and call a friend, step outside for fresh air, take three minutes and set a timer and just meditate or be in silence, listen to music, take a little time out. So it helps, you know, sometimes we try and power through. It actually is more beneficial to stop, feel the emotion, acknowledge it, pay attention to it and try and address it. Find a different behavior versus turning towards food. Try and get that consistent sleep. So every book I've read on sleep, um, I did an education course on sleep. The most important thing was setting an alarm and getting up the same time each day. So regardless of the day of the week, what you had going on, trying to be on a schedule, even if that meant, you know, you got less sleep, you know, you had trouble falling asleep, trying to just get in bed, no distractions. I, in a perfect world, aiming for that seven to eight hours of sleep for an adult. Okay, so we see the screens. This is, you know, it unfortunately affects kids as well, but avoiding LED screens at least one to two hours before bed, trying to use the night mode on electronics. Same with the news. It's been a very stressful, upsetting year for many people trying to avoid that anxiety provoking news an hour or two before bed, you will sleep better. Practice self-love. It is easier said than done, um, but positive self-talk makes a huge difference. You know, if we can talk to ourselves like you would talk to a dear close friend, getting enough sleep, staying physically active, practicing deep breathing or a yoga or meditation and giving yourself some grace, realizing that one bad meal or one bad day will not destroy your ent entire journey to a healthier you. Um, you know, and do you view yourself as a success or as a failure? You know, how you view yourself is often predicting the outcome. Okay, and remembering every day we get a chance to start fresh, you know, go into it with a certain mindset. And again, that's a predictor of how the day is going to go. So with that, if we tie that back to kind of here we are, January is almost over, but a new year. Did you make, you know, a New Year's resolution? It doesn't have to be New Year's. It could be a goal for February you know, and do any of these five kind of ring a bell with you? Where is this something that's been on your mind to either exercise more, eat healthier, lose weight, save money, or be financially more responsible or self-care? If so, you're not alone. You know, again, these are the top five most common for this year. With that though, I would encourage you to make sure if you're setting a goal to make it smart. So make it specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So an example is, you know, don't set a goal that's I'm going to eat healthier or this year I'm going to exercise more. Okay. Those are, those aren't smart goals. They're very vague and can feel overwhelming. A smart goal would be to say, I'm going to get in five fruits and vegetables a day. If by dinner I have fallen short, I'll make them up by having more at dinner and maybe a fruit in the evening. You know, that's specific. You can measure, did you meet that goal or not? 
uh, a smart exercise goal might be to start out with saying, I am consistently going to do 20 to 30 minutes of exercise a day. Okay. So those are more smart goals. They're measurable and achievable. Sometimes we have to look beyond the scale. Okay. The scale is one measurement. Um, it is a big measurement, but with that, you know, if you're going to start on a journey to losing weight, eating healthier, exercising more, have you gone to your doctor recently? I know some people miss their usual physical last year due to the pandemic. So again, there could be things going on. It, it helps to know, you know, what are your labs? You know, is your thyroid in range? Is your cholesterol, your blood sugar? These are all things that, you know, knowledge is power. Do we need to get things in range to help us be able to lose and maintain weight? As well as with the UCI weight management program, we look beyond the scale and we have an in-body machine which looks at body composition. So this is similar to the gold standard of hydrostatic weighing where you can see what your body is made up of. How much is water? How much is muscle mass? And how much is fat mass? So if we're just using a bathroom scale, we're not monitoring if we're losing muscle or fat. So some diets out there, if you're just looking at restricting calories, we could be losing muscle and fat. We want to keep our muscle and just be losing fat. We also want to know medically what's going on with us as an individual and what risk factors do we have to make sure we're on an individual plan that is best for us. So that would be kind of in closing, I would make sure that you you know, had a physical, you know what's going on, you know your personal risk factors. So then you can, you know, work with a dietitian to set up a personalized individual plan to reach that healthy goal. And it's, it is achievable and it's definitely, you can maintain it. Um, the biggest thing we wanna avoid is losing weight to gain it back. So we wanna make it, you know, a lot of the visuals are just making that shift and choices to have a healthier mindset and really just fuel our bodies to feel good. We have one body, one life, and we wanna make the most of it. So thank you everyone. Here is to a new you. And I just hope that you found that beneficial. And I wanna switch over to Adrian and see if there's any questions I can help answer. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Katie. That was uh, actually very colorful. <laughs> I, I think it was beautiful to look at these plates and, and to say, this is going to please me much more visually if I eat like this instead of eating the things I've been eating before. Uh, now, let's see. I'm, I have a question here about what is metabolic syndrome? So metabolic syndrome is, it takes multiple factors and kind of combines them. So it either, it either means there's few things that play into factor weight. So being overweight, being pre-diabetic, being, having elevated cholesterol, insulin resistance. Um, so when you have a combination of more than one of those factors, it's considered metabolic syndrome, kind of not quite diabetic or, you know, heart disease, but it's multiple factors showing up as risks. Okay. And then I have a question here about the BMI data. Uh, Deborah Lawton wants to know if this was challenged in recent studies. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. So BMI is, I mean, that's the body mass index and BMI is a simple calculation based on height and weight. It, you know, it's been around forever and it definitely has been challenged. Um, the biggest thing there is you take a football player or an extreme athlete that has a higher muscle mass, they're gonna have a higher BMI and come up as obese or overweight, even though they may not be. 
Um, BMI is still used just because it's such an easy tool. You can determine a BMI just with a calculator. Um, but definitely the body composition, knowing how much muscle mass, fat mass, water mass, skeletal mass is much more valuable information. It's just harder to attain. It used to be you'd have to be submerged in a hydro, a water tank. Um, now there are more fancy scales, which we're blessed to have one at UCI, but it does bioelectrical impedance through hands and feet to measure that. And it's it's much easier and it's much more valuable information. So BMI still used, it is still challenged. Um, it's not the best, but it, it definitely is still used just because of simplification. And now we have a question here about organic versus uh, regular fruits and vegetables. I think we hear so much about that, don't we? We're, we're told to buy organic that Yes, definitely. I mean, that's a great question. So I would say if you're able to purchase organic, organic is healthier. Um, the biggest argument there is it's not regulated very well. Um, so we may be paying for more for organic. And if it's not regulated, do we truly know that it's, you know, pesticide free was truly from an organic farm? Um, that said, if you had to choose which to buy organic, I would say things like berries that are more porous, you know, it's better to buy organic berries versus organic banana where you're going to discard the peel or an orange where you'll discard the peel. So you can kind of think of how porous the fruit or vegetable is. Um, you know, if you can, it's definitely helpful. If not, you know, just wash your fruits and vegetables. That's, that's really helpful advice about the porousness. I hadn't ever thought of that. Uh, I have a question about these chicken sandwiches that are being advertised and talked about so much. They had a big article in the register a couple of weeks ago about all of these restaurants now that have takeout chicken sandwiches and they're all fried chicken. I mean, <laughs> and then they had an article last week about fast food stores that the, the fast food restaurant chains are all introducing new chicken sandwiches. They're terrible for us, I think, yeah. Right, I mean, that's that's the hard thing. I mean, we really have to put on our own thinking cap and do our own research because if we listen to the marketing, we will be strayed the wrong way, you know? So a grilled chicken sandwich, yes, that's a healthy option. If it's a battered or deep fried chicken sandwich, I mean, it's basically the same as, you know, the burger. It's now a higher fat, higher calorie choice um, that we're really not getting much benefit from. Okay. Well, I think you're telling us we need to practice self-discipline and to be responsible in our lives for the choices we make. Uh, some people have a cheat day once a week. Do you recommend that? So... <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a trick question. <laughs> so, I mean, the hard part with the cheat day is, you know, people can be so good, you know, six days out of the week. And if that cheat day is, you know, just go crazy, we can kind of wipe out all the hard work we did all week. So we want to avoid that. Um, I do think there needs to be, you know, you need, you can't feel deprived. You need to still allow the foods you crave and you like, but in smaller portions, moderation. It might be, you know, if you know you really want a dessert, you might order a really healthy dinner and eat healthy the rest of the day to account for it. So I think if you can view food almost like you would a budget in shopping, you know, you might look at how much does this shirt cost or these pants, does it fit in my budget? you know, kind of ask being aware of what is your caloric budget for the day. You know, if I want that splurge, does it fit in my day? Have I been sensible, you know, the rest of the day, made sure to get my exercise in so I don't have to feel like I'm cheating or going off? That <laughs> it's part, part, part of our being responsible. I have quite a few questions here about water because we buy this bottled water do you recommend alkaline water? Are there better waters than others that we should be choosing? 
Yeah, that's a good question. It's definitely mixed research on the waters. There's no negative to doing the alkaline water or a, a smart water or a water with electrolytes, um, but you don't have to. Um, so there's no study that has shown that, you know, there's real negative to if all you have access to is tap water, there's still a benefit to getting, you know, especially here in Orange County. Yes, it's hard water, but there's no true, you know, health concern. Um, the big thing is just getting in the water and there might be a preference. Do you like cold water, room temperature water? Are you more likely to drink more if you have a bottle with a straw? that you can do while you're working versus having to stop and have two hands to take the top off and take a sip. Um, I think it's more important to focus on getting the water in. Um, and I personally am less concerned with what type of water. At 64 ounces is a lot of water. <laughs> uh, we have a question about intermittent fasting. What do you think of that? So intermittent fasting, that's definitely popular right now. There, there, has def, there is benefit to it. Um, I think it depends how you're using it. Um, the idea is to limit kind of the hours that you eat within. Um, it works well for some people. Other people, especially if you tend to get low blood sugar um, or low blood sugar symptoms when you go a long time without eating, of lightheaded dizziness, I, I would stay away from it there. Um, but for some people, it works great. It limits the hours, and especially if it cuts off the hours where you tend to be an evening snacker, and now you're not eating in the evening. It, it works great for some people. Um, other people, depending on their medical concerns, it might not be the best route, but I think it's definitely a, a good tool. Thank you. Uh, one more question about plant-based milks and yogurts. This, I guess this would be the, like the soy. Yeah, so plant-based, there's a ton of research pushing for plant-based, um, whether that's plant-based dairy, plant-based protein, um, milks, yogurt, as well as a meat source. Um, thinking, it, you know, if we grow it back to kind of the hunter and gathers, a little bit of the paleo, plant-based is great. You know, I would recommend at least half kind of your protein, half your dairy, if it can be plant-based, you're cutting out that animal fat, you know, that saturated fat, which we know isn't good for our arteries, heart health. Um, and there's a lot more options, I'd say, in the past decade with plant sources of dairy and protein than we've ever had. Okay, thank you. And I have a question here that ends with, thank you for a beautiful presentation. <laughs> uh, we would like to thank you, Katie, for being with us today. And I think inspiring us to take responsibility for our own health and, and to move forward with, with vigor and uh, enthusiasm for life, so. Yes, you can do it, you can do it. Eating healthy can be fun and colorful. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone back here next month. Our speaker will be Dr. Susan Wang. She'll be talking about the COVID-19 vaccines. Hopefully by then many of us will have already had them. So.